Do our genes tell us who we are? That's the subject of a pre presentation by John Entine of the American Enterprise Institute during a conference in Kansas City on November 2nd, 2009. Uh, John, an important yet a delicate question, do our genes tell us who we are, especially when that question involves Jews and genetic testing? Talk about that a little bit. Well, I think we tend to um, hope that we can um, somehow explain actions, complex actions in the world using simple formulas. And genes really fits that kind of model. We think that um, there's a gene that helps explain aggressive behavior, intelligence, risk taking, wide range of things. In fact, we see stories about this all in the press all the time. What we are learning now is that de genes do prescribe behavior. They set the limits of what we can be. But what fills up that kind of house of life is the experiences of, of who we are. So this makes this question very, very delicate, very, very complex, and it's especially complex when focused on a community, a religious and ethnic community known as the Jews, because historically, um, Judaism, unlike Christianity or Islam, um, where people come together because of a shared faith, Jews come together not only because of a shared faith, but because of a historical genetic ancestral bloodline connection. So Judaism has these multiple threads um, that add layers of questions about what is a Jew, what is identity, how do we understand ourselves um, in the context of our genes. So the implications of all that line of thinking uh, take various tracks, uh, religious, historical, medical. Uh, let's talk about religious first. Yeah, uh, Judaism is an ancient tribal religion founded by a group of people, not by um, a coherent group, as the Bible suggests, uh, coming with Abraham to settle in the land of Canaan. But we know enough about anthropological and genetic history now to know that the um, early Israelites were a conglomeration of people, um, some Phoenicians, Sea Peoples, um, some who had come from um, the Fertile Crescent, some from southern parts of, of, of uh, uh, Arabia and had all come together and over time coalesced, but again, not into one people, but into groups of tribes. The Bible talks about the, the 10 tribes, the 12 tribes, but we don't really know if that really is the, what existed at that time. But we do know based on um, what happened in that period of time in history that religious beliefs began developing, um, growing up in the seeds of various cultures, some small communities and some large megacultures and, and region. And that's the um, seeds of the faith really is the conflicts that went on between these various groups vying for narratives, vying for interpretations of, of their um, historical interpretations of, of, of how they came to be. They literally looked at the cosmos, um, looked at what the little that they knew about how the earth had come to be at that point and came up with stories about it. And those stories competed and over time began to overlap and in the case of Judaism, formed a um, compelling narrative, which then also was updated many, many times over hundreds of years and different iterations that became the Bible. So religious implications, the historical implications that you talked about, then there are the clinical implications that you address somewhat today as well. Sure, what, what makes Judaism so interesting is that it's one of only two surviving what I call tribal religions. Uh, religions based in geography, based in ancestry, based in bloodlines, or asterism, much tinier is, a, is another example of that. Um, what that really means is, is that Jews are endogamous. They marry within the culture. Um, Ashkenazi Jewry, European Jewry, most Jews today are of European ancestry. Um, about 9 to 11 million of all Jews today um, share that ancestry. The other major two groups are Sephardic Jews, which trace their ancestry to Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, and that collapsed with the Holy Inquisition, and then so-called Mizrahi Jews that are from the Oriental areas, the Middle East, um, and, and have remained indigenous to Palestine and so forth. So most Ashkenazi Jews um, are from Europe. They didn't start as an insular population until the 15th, 16th centuries. They went from 15 to 20,000 people to a community of uh, 15 to 20 million in the 20th century. But remarkably, they married only among themselves. The, the, uh, the, the introgression rate, the rate of people who came into the Jewish gene pool from outside of it, intermarriage is an example of how that happens, was less than 0.5% per generation, marking Jews as the most insular of world populations. And when you have an insular population, 
Behavioral characteristics, and most importantly for us today, disease factors end up staying within that um, group. So Jews are a genetic gold mine because they carry so many diseases um, because of that insular population staying together, intermarrying over so many centuries. Now, thinking about this, writing about it, putting together television, radio productions on this can carry some controversy with it, can it not? Well, I think the, whenever you use a term like race, um, which was supposedly discredited um, after World War II, uh, there was UN commissions de decrying the, the whole racial history of the world. Um, Jews were killed because they were thought of having one drop of, of Jewish blood mark them as a Jewish race, because you go back to the early uh, 20th century, Jews thought of themselves and were thought of as a race. Um, that's not acceptable today because we are so much of a melting pot. Um, African Americans are African and Americans. They carry European genes along with their, with, their, with their black African genes. But the reality of it is the modern world, which seems so much of a melting pot, is just a tiny, tiny little sliver of world history. We are much more shaped by the tens of thousands of years of evolution than we are by the last 50 or 60 years. So we carry within our genome the history of having been insular Jewish populations, the Basque regions in Spain, um, Costa Rican populations, Iceland, which is an island, and in fact larger groupings, Northern Europeans, East Asians, all those groups, um, smaller and larger, intermarried, kept characteristics, genetic physical characteristics, body type characteristics, a whole wide range of things, and that loosely marks what we call race. We don't like to talk about it because there's so many simplistic, noxious, destructive, naive, unscientific um, um, linkages to the, to the concept of race, but if we could substitute the word population, as scientists do, here we go. We are a, a, a collection of um, somewhat distinct but definitely overlapping populations that have different disease proclivities, different behavior characteristics, a whole wide range of things, and that's dynamite when you talk about it in a place like America that believes that everybody is born equal. Now, you use the word taboo, and that's part of your title for a book that you wrote on how uh, black athletes tend to dominate sports, and that carried some controversy with it as well. Absolutely. Did that controversy help prepare you for some of the um, reaction, perhaps backlash, that you're receiving as you continue down this track? Well, I, I learned who makes the best flak jackets, that's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, t Taboo had the, at the time, heretical thesis that different populations, um, again, using the, the scientific word instead of the popular word race, um, do better in certain sports, not only because of cultural reasons, there aren't a lot of Texans playing in the National Hockey League, um, but also because of genetic reasons, that East Africans have a body type that tends to contribute to them doing dominating in, in, uh, in things like the Olympics, uh, in, in long distance racing, the New York Marathon, both the male and female winners were from East Africa. Um, West Africans, African Americans are almost exclusively of West African ancestry, tend to dominate in sports that require quick jumping and running, everything from the 100 meters to basketball to football. Whites dominate in the strength events. These are all, to some degree, circumscribed by the body types that evolved in very different climates. Um, so what I tried to do in Taboo was say, yeah, there are racial differences in sports, but let's keep the quotes on race and let's redefine it and talk about the differences between East and West Africans, which have a very different genetic um, population architecture, yet at the same time scare, uh, share a black skin color. So you can't mm. just call them the same race. They're in effect different populations. Once you start getting out of the historically racist um, ways to describe human differences, and you put it in the modern lexicon of population, it, it seems a little bit more um, easy to understand, and frankly, um, once Taboo came out, bl blacks got it. Suddenly it took away the racist way of looking at the issue. Scientists have always talked in these terms and are getting more confident about talking about it publicly as they're not um, hooted down for raising these things. But sure, it did prepare me um, to be extra careful, as you can tell in the words I use now, uh, in how I describe human differences. But the reality of it is that this issue keeps coming back and coming back. Um, we have moved from the age where we have proven that humans have a shared ancestry. That was what came out of the Human Genome Project. I call that the Kumbaya age of human genetic research. We are now into the much more important age, which is to find differences. Why? Not because we want to show that um, someone's better than someone else, 
but because we want to show that we can isolate various diseases, find cures for them, and actually improve humanity. And the reality of it is the, the, um, uh, the petri dishes for this kinds of investigation are smaller subpopulations like the Jews, the Maoris, the Costa Ricans, the Amish, the Basque region people, the Icelanders. That's really where genetic research is focused now on populations that have this you know, rich uh, body of evidence. John Antine is with the American Enterprise Institute. His books can be found on Amazon.com. And the audio of his presentation in Kansas City on November the 2nd, 2009, is available on the website of the Center for Practical Bioethics, practicalbioethics.org. John Antine, thanks for your time today. Thank you.